as, as uh, Patty said, I am the general counsel for the AKC, and I'm also in charge of the compliance division. Um, I have been with the AKC for about two and a half years, and I was not hired originally as the general counsel. I came in as the AVP of compliance. I took Tom Sharp's place. Some of you may know Tom. He's now the head of AKC CAR. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to combine years of regulatory compliance and enforcement on the on behalf of the federal government and several federal agencies with my love of purebred dogs and the support of purebred dogs and my respect for what the AKC does and my, my belief that the AKC's compliance programs are really what set us apart. And I, I thought it was a great opportunity to be a part of all of that. After I came to the AKC, and it was also, quite candidly, a chance to do a non-lawyer job for a while, which I thought was kind of exciting and uh, I was ready for that change. Unfortunately, my boss, Michael Swick, announced his retirement six months after I came to the AKC. And so, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, the executive staff uh, asked me to step up and um, be the general counsel. But their, their intent was that I also retain um, responsibility for the compliance programs. What they didn't know is that they were they thought they were saving money and being clever by doing that. Really, uh, what they were doing was throwing me into the briar patch because, as I said, the reason I came to the AKC was uh, because of the compliance program, and I'm very passionate about it, and I would not have let go of it for anything. So I am, to my knowledge, the first AKC general counsel um, that has also had direct responsibility for the compliance programs, too, and, and I'm very proud of it, and I love my job. So. Um, I know that <laughs> in large part um, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, a lot of you know what I'm going to say about the AKC and can probably say it much more eloquently and based on many more years of dedication to it than I have. Um, but for those of you that aren't, and just for the record because I love to say these things <laughs> out loud and I don't get a lot of opportunities to do them, um, I am, I am going to brag about us and what we do. And uh, as many of you know, we celebrated last year our 125th anniversary. We don't have the extensive history that Ringling does. I was surprised to hear that number, but I guess I shouldn't have been. But the AKC has a long history too, 100, over 125 years. So for over a century, the American Kennel Club has been dedicated to the promotion of responsible breeding of purebred dogs and responsible dog ownership. And when you think about that, um, that's a long time to be dedicated to that, that very lofty goal. Um, it's given us a lot of time to think about how to do it well, to make some mistakes along the way, and to hopefully learn from those mistakes. Um, the AKC, a lot of people, when they think about the AKC, they think about a singular purpose or a singular mission. Namely, for most people, they think about the dog show that they see on TV on an annual basis, particularly the Westminster Kennel Club dog show, that many people who are not otherwise interested in the sport of purebred dogs carve out the time to watch. But the truth is that the AKC is dedicated to so much more. And if you take a look at our mission statement, you see that it is a very broad uh, statement of purpose. And it encompasses a lot of things other than just the singular sport uh, and particularly confirmation shows. It goes much deeper than that. And it is a, an all-encompassing philosophy. It is, in my opinion, a a value system, if you will, about how we value our dogs and what our dogs give us and what is our responsibility to give to them. And as I say, this has been going on for a long time and uh, we have given a lot of thought to how you protect those values and how you protect the dogs. And in doing that, the AKC has created a compliance department that is dedicated to upholding our rules and our policies and procedures, but more importantly, communicating the message of what it means to be associated with the American Kennel Club, to be a responsible breeder, to be a responsible dog owner. So what are the AKC's objectives in our compliance programs? We are not a governmental regulator. 
We are a not-for-profit dog registry, and so we have much more flexibility, if you will, in how we go about implementing a compliance program than, say, a state or municipality would have. We have tried to develop a compliance program that enforces and regulates but also embodies education and outreach, again, to communicate to people about what we value in the raising and breeding and keeping of dogs. So we work to assist our customers in identifying the areas of deficiency. We try to educate them. We try to um, explain to them our expectations when it comes to care and conditions, when it comes to dog identification, when it comes to accurate record keeping, which again goes back to the integrity of the registry. And we work to assist those customers to come into compliance. We reach out to customers um, based on their activity, but we will also respond to complaints. We will um, inspect customers regardless of whether they are a hobby breeder or a commercial breeder, regardless of their profit motive. And we attempt to play two roles. Um, we, again, we want to uphold the rules and the requirements of the registry, but at the same time we want to educate. And we feel like it's much more beneficial to have a positive educational approach than it is to be a regulatory foe. After all, um, the adversarial mechanisms of enforcement are very, are very costly, not only to us as an organization, but they're costly to breeders and they're costly to the vast body of, of breeders, to all of us, when it's necessary for us to, stay, to step in and take enforcement or we're forced to do something. Um, the AKC is very proud of its inspections program. We are the only non-governmental entity in the United States that has an inspections program. The current version of the program was instituted in 1991. That's the point at which AKC went from a purely complaint-driven inspections program to the implementation of a program that, that inspected a broad cross-section of breeders um, that registered dogs with us. In 1996, the board passed the care and conditions policy, which tasked our inspectors with going out and taking a look at the care that was provided for the dogs and the conditions of the facility in which they were housed, in addition to looking at the accuracy of the records. AKC currently spends over $2 million on our inspections program, and we've done in excess of 35,000 inspections in the last 10 years. Again, our experience to, to us demonstrates that, and again, because we have this flexibility of being a not-for-profit entity, um, our experience demonstrates that when we employ a combination of voluntary and compulsory strategies, um, that assists our breeders in coming into compliance. They want to be in compliance. That, that's what people want, and that benefits us. It benefits the dogs and it assists our breeders in achieving compliance and meeting our expectations. Um, that's not to say that if, if we find people who are not in compliance that we will not take action. Uh, we certainly have the obligation to do that. We work with people, we give them an opportunity to correct deficiencies, but if they don't, then we certainly have suspended breeders. The AKC's care and conditions policy um, is a comprehensive policy. It is, unlike some other um, institutions that run kennel inspection programs, ours is uh, performance-based. We have performance-based standards as opposed to technical requirements. Um, as I said, uh, if we find problems with the breeder, we can place their privileges on hold for the period of time that's necessary for them to come in compliance, but if they don't, um, then the breeder is suspended from all AKC privileges. We work with the breeder, we conduct an inspection, we give them information about what we find not to be in compliance, um, we give them a certain period of time to correct those deficiencies, we go back out and re-inspect, and if they are in compliance at that time, then great. If not, um, depending on the nature of the problems, uh, we may give them some additional time to, to um, cure those deficiencies, but uh, in some cases that may not be feasible. In all cases where dogs are in imminent danger, um, we will notify local authorities. 
because we're not a governmental entity, we don't have the opportunity to, or the power, to seize dogs, to take dogs out of a, a bad situation. So we notify local authorities, the state authorities, even the USDA where it's appropriate, um, and, and let them know that there's a situation where dogs are in imminent harm. As I said, our care and conditions policy is one that is performance-based. And we're looking at a variety of factors when we go out there that affect the health, safety, and welfare of the dogs and the facilities and the environment in which they're kept. We want to see, for example, a facility that's structurally sound, that's well constructed, that doesn't pose any dangers or risks, there aren't protruding edges or uh, rotting boards or rusted metal. Um, we want to make sure that there's adequate opportunity for shelter, for the dog to get out of the elements, to be uh, warm, dry, um, have adequate ventilation, light, opportunity for exercise. I want to make sure that the facility is clean, that there's a regular um, pr program implemented that takes care of uh, disposal of waste, um, that water and food is available and that the receptacles in which they're kept are clean. We want to make sure that there's clean bedding, that the facilities are parasite free. Um, it's in terms of the condition of the dogs, we want to make sure that they look like they're in good condition, that they're healthy, that there are no issues that ne uh, necessitate immediate veterinary attention, that they're uh, relatively you know, parasite free given the season and what, what might be going on. We um, want to see a facility that looks like this. And we do, very often, um, unlike what's portrayed in the media about um, large, high-volume uh, facilities, um, there are commercial kennels that look like this, and we see them on a regular basis. Um, one of the programs that we've instituted that we're very proud of and against, it goes to this overall philosophy of wanting to educate and reach out to breeders early on um, to bring them into compliance and to be able to sustain that compliance. Because again, you cannot sustain um, and achieve compliance for a long period of time by simply employing um, regulatory enforcement. It just doesn't work. You cannot beat people into submission any more than you can animals. Um, and so you, in order to uh, sustain that compliance, you ha it has to be uh, of a voluntary nature to some extent, and you achieve that through educating people. And so the AKC in, t in 2003 instituted the first time inspection program, which was an effort to reach out to breeders very early on in the process uh, when they began to demonstrate that they were uh, ramping up their breeding level, so to speak. And, and it's an effort to um, go out, inspect those people, identify the areas of noncompliance, educate them uh, about what our rules and our policies and procedures are. Um, it's designed as a learning experience, a coaching experience, if you will, intervening early enough in that uh, causal chain that might lead to noncompliant behavior. So we may get to a breeder um, who has, for the first time, say, bred five litters. And we, we see when we get there that there are some issues. Maybe they don't understand that um, they're nursing mothers should be segregated from their other dogs, that that benefits her, that that reduces her stress, and that in turn helps the pups. And so we educate them about giving uh, the nursing mothers, the, the mothers due to well, a separate area, a private area where they are kept away from the rest of the dogs. Um, you educate people about those things rather than dinging them with the noncompliance, and when you go back the next time, the results are amazing. We see tremendous, um, rates of compliance among those first-time inspection candidates when we get to them early on. We build that relationship with that breeder. We, we advise them of, of the resources that are available to them through the AKC. Um, we, we create that connection. We create that bond. We make them a part of our family, if you will, um, and introduce them to our philosophy uh, our requirements, all the programs that are available to assist them, and being proactive like that, uh, again, creates a pattern of sustained compliance with those breeders, which of course benefits the dogs. It helps us to prevent 
the recurrence or occurrence if you, in the first instance of violations and improve the conditions uh, among the novice breeders early on and, and builds a, a community of, of knowledgeable and experienced breeders. That process, that philosophy, that belief in education and outreach it decreases the necessity of disciplinary action on down the road with those folks. I'm sure you're all sitting here thinking, well, isn't she just Miss Mary Sunshine? And isn't everything <laughs> wonderful in the dog breeding world? <laughs> what about the puppy mills? <laughs> okay. Well, um, as Jan said early on uh, in her talk, and I will say, we haven't done everything right, and we're still not doing anything, everything right. And I will admit that. But I will ask you today to take a pledge with me. I will not use the term puppy mill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's their term. That's not our term. Um, and language is very important in this debate. Uh, we cannot buy in to their terminology and allow them to frame the debate. Uh, if you don't believe that, look at what's happened in Missouri. The title of the bill, an act to prevent puppy mill cruelty, or the Puppy Mill Cruelty Prevention Act, that in and of itself is going to give them a win. It doesn't matter what it says. Do you think anybody's going to bother to read it? Do you think anybody other than commercial breeders and hobby breeders and dog show enthusiasts in Missouri have any idea what it says? But who in the general public is going to vote against something that says prevent puppy mill cruelty? We can't, we can't allow that. We can't buy into it. And if we ourselves use that term, we are just giving fuel to their fire. So. We refer to them as substandard kennels. And they are not acceptable to me, to anyone on my inspection staff, to anybody that I know that works with the AKC. Um, and they are not acceptable for this reason. We don't want to see any dogs treated that way. And it's not a function of how big the kennel is or how many dogs it houses or whether the person's operating it for a profit motive. If somebody has a dog chained in their backyard that doesn't have adequate shelter or food or water, that's not okay. And the animal rights people would not call them a puppy mill. So it's, it's an issue of standards of care. Um, and we at the AKC believe that we need to have all breeders engaged with us and buying into our philosophy and our beliefs and our value system because that's in the best interest of the dogs. And the size of that facility doesn't determine quality of care. We want to be there because when we're there, we're able to make a difference. And if those people don't register us, if people don't register with the AKC, if they don't avail themselves of our services, we have no right to be there and no opportunity to make a difference in the lives of those dogs. And that's what matters. Um, so, I've gotten all preachy on you on this Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to take it back down a notch and admit that, yeah, we do have some problems and we do have some room for improvement. And um, one of the things that we need to, to consider uh, as a community is that we need to think about taking care of our own. And, and one of the things that we see as, in, as the inspection department is breeders who are um, reaching a certain age that they can't care for their dogs properly or the economy has affected them adversely and they are not in a position to care for their dogs in the same way that they have always cared for them. Or there is an illness or some other debilitating condition that has affected their ability to care for their dogs. And dog people, shocking, I know, are a very proud bunch. And uh, we're also a very judgmental bunch. <laughs> and those two things come together um, to prevent people from asking for help 
and prevent people from reaching out and giving help. And what I would say to you is, again, if we don't want to give fodder to the other side, then we have an obligation to take care of our own. And we need to make it easier for people to ask for help, and we need to uh, be more forthcoming with help without judgment. And if um, I'm here long enough to make a difference, that will be the thing that I, I would like to see change in our community, is that, that we uh, set up a mechanism where someone who needs that help can come and ask for it and receive assistance for those dogs and receive help placing those dogs that they don't have the ability to care for and we will provide that kind of assistance without judgment because if we don't do that then we have a situation where the HSUS steps in they raid a kennel they take some poor person's dogs um, they adopt them out the next day at North Shore for 250 bucks a pop and um, they make hay out of the idea that some AKC breeder judge, you know, has fallen on whatever. So we don't want that to happen. Sermon over. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so what we see is that uh, when we get involved with these breeders and they get involved with us, um, this positive relationship forms that builds goodwill, it, it breeds loyalty, it breeds breeder satisfaction, it breeds a, a, a knowledge and an acceptance of the availability of certain resources and uh, certain best practices that they should employ for the betterment of their dogs. That in turn serves a broader public purpose. Um, it enhances breeders' uh, attitudes about breeders that um, finding breeders in violation would serve to diminish. And what I mean by that is this. Um, when any one of us gets busted, it hurts all of us. And so if we can work together through education and outreach and communicate to people what's expected and communicate to them the resources that are available to them and educate them about better standards for breeding and keeping dogs. And that keeps them in compliance, that keeps them um, above, uh, up at a certain level, not the lowest common denominator, but, but up at a level of higher standards that benefits all of us at breeder, as breeders. It brings a good name to all of us. And the flip side of that is if any, anyone whether they are part of the AKC family or not, when a dog breeder is raided, it reflects negatively on all of us and feeds this whole um, attitude, if you will, that we're all bad. We want the public to see this image. We want the public to believe that there is such a thing as the appropriate way to raise and breed dogs. We don't want them to see this. We want them to see this. And this is the face that we want to have on, on the breeding of dogs. So together we combine inspections, an inspection program that is proactive, that includes outreach to new breeders, to novice breeders, that educates people, um, and that produces higher standards. And we work not only through the inspections programs, but a variety of programs to to communicate, to reach out, to educate these breeders and raise the standards of all of them. And as I said, if people uh, elect to register their dogs with the AKC, then that gives us an opportunity for that outreach and that education and helps raise the standards of all breeders. Uh, another one of our compliance mechanisms that I want to mention is the AKC DNA program. I am very proud of the DNA program. <laughs> um, I think it's something else that sets us apart. And I know that we have taken some hits in the press uh, for the DNA program, and it's been cited as one of the things that drove the commercial breeders away from the AKC. I disagree. Um, I think that our combination of voluntary and mandatory programs speaks to our integrity and what we expect. It speaks to our commitment to um, health and genetics 
Because after all, what is the point of genetics testing without first establishing parentage? Um, and I will say that it is a way that we, again, distinguish ourselves and demonstrate to people what we expect and the value that we place on employing the highest standards, the most uh, current technologies, and every club that we have in the bag to use to best breed dogs. Um, this philosophy of education and outreach extends beyond just the compliance program. And the AKC has a whole panoply, I love that word, I throw it in wherever I can, um, of programs for breeders um, intended to educate them, to indoctrinate them, if you want to use that word, into AKC's value system um, and the values that we pr place on responsible breeders and responsible breeding practices and encouraging breast practices and increasing opportunities for education and increasing opportunities for novice breeders to interact with more experienced breeders. We, we have, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, um, the AKC is a club of clubs and our member clubs are our parent clubs, the club for each recognized AKC breed. And those parent clubs are made up of people who have given their lives for the betterment of their breed. Now, what better resource for somebody who is a novice breeder than that, that body of folks who are committed to Shelties or Boxers or Papillons or Dalmatians than that parent club? It's a tremendous resource that we have that people who have forgotten more about raising and breeding dogs than most of us will ever know. All of that comes together under the AKC umbrella to help breeders. Here are a few examples of the breeder resources that we have that are outside our compliance mechanisms. The AKC offers on an annual basis, and I think they do at least half a dozen a year, uh, breeder symposiums all across the country. They're typically held at vet schools. They're held in connection with our affiliate organization, the AKC Canine Health Foundation. For 95 bucks, a breeder can go to a breeder symposium at a vet school in your area, and again, they're offered all over the country, and you can go on the website and find out the location. You can hear some of the best and the brightest minds in the country talk about breeding dogs. Not only breeders and exhibitors and people who have dedicated their lives to breeding, but you can talk about, you can hear some of the leading veterinarians and scientists in the country talk about canine genetics and reproduction and nutrition. It's a wonderful resource. We have a breeder newsletter that's available to anybody who wants it. It's free. Go online, subscribe to it. It can be sent to you electronically or in hard copy. If you, if you breed a litter, you get it automatically. It's a great resource, has some wonderful articles in it. Um, we have all kinds of breeder resources on the website. If you go to the AKC website, you click on the uh, tab breeder, the things that it will pull up are un unbelievable in terms of wealth of information. We have in-house a breeder relations group a group of staff that is dedicated to nothing other than helping breeders deal with issues like registering litters, um, dealing with wave and late fees, dealing with pedigree research. Um, we will help you in any way that we can. Um, there, that group also has some field staff that will come out and speak to clubs or breeder professional associations. And that group has also been responsible for putting on health clinics. And they educate, again, novice breeders about things like the, the importance of surf testing or um, OFA or chick. They bring in veterinarians to, to listen to hearts, to check for heart murmurs. And, and those clinics are free. We also have a vast array of canine health resources available to people, all on the web, um, all will direct breeders to different sources of information. Um, there is a whole section on the AKC website uh, dedicated as a canine health resource center. 
And from that one landing page, you can go to all sorts of other sites that are dedicated to canine health information. We also have the AKC Canine Health Foundation, the AKC's uh, affiliate organization. We gave birth to this organization in 1995 and has since its inception, uh, the AKC has given over $19 million for the benefit of canine health research. Our parent clubs have given tremendous amounts of money also to the Canine Health Foundation to, to uh, fund grants in various studies of genetic disease and um, other incidents of disease in their respective breeds. There's also information on our website and it will direct you to the web pages of both the Canine Health Information Center or CHIC as well as the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals or OFA, two organizations with whom we work very closely. AKC instituted a new program Friday <laughs> uh, called the Breeder Merit Program. We finally reached a place where we feel like it's time to start talking about our breeders and how great they are and acknowledging the good work that they do. And with this program, um, we will pay tribute to breeders who breed and raise dogs responsibly and adhere to responsible breeding practices, best practices, particularly uh, practices that are prescribed by their own parent clubs with regard to health screening and genetics testing. And also breeders who have demonstrated success in the sport, uh, other uh, performance or obedience or agility activities and have supported the sport as members of clubs. So it's, it's a great opportunity to finally say to the public, these are the people. These are the people you need to talk to. These are the people that we acknowledge as the best of the best. And these are your sources for information about breeds and your source for puppies. And so that's where it all comes back to, folks. We can sit around in this room amongst ourselves and talk about, you know, how great we are and what we do and uh, share information with each other. But at the end of the day, if we don't start communicating it to the public, it won't matter. And so part of education and outreach and um, raising standards in breeding is telling the public what it's all about. Educating the public, assisting them in finding the right kind of breeders, um, it's assisting them in knowing what to look for in finding a responsible breeder, and once they find that puppy, puppy, how to be a responsible dog owner. And again, the AKC offers that too. There are resources on our website uh, about finding a responsible breeder, how to go about buying a puppy, who to contact, parent club information for every breed that the AKC uh, recognizes, and also the same health information that's available to breeders. But we have to communicate that to them too. We have to counter the message from the other side that there really is such a thing as a responsible breeder. There really is such a way to go about finding a purebred dog and you should want that because of the predictability, because of your lifestyle, because of the unique needs of your family. This is the only way that you can accomplish those things is through a purebred dog. If that's, if that's what's important to you. And, and we have to do a better job of communicating that to the public. We're not doing that now. One of the things that the AKC has started, um, we had our first one last year and we're having it again this year, October 16th and 17th in New York at the Javits Center, is Meet the Breeds. Um, it will be an opportunity for the public to come to the Javits Center in New York and meet all the AKC recognized breeds. We will have Knockwood, um, representatives of, we think at this, at last count, over 150 breeds. And we are doing this in conjunction with the cat fanciers, so they will have cat breeds there too. Um, we have, we had, we had no idea what to expect last year when we did this. 
and we had over 35,000 people attend over two days. People love purebred dogs, and this is an opportunity for them to come in and put their hands on them and talk to the people who are devoted to that breed and learn about that breed and learn about where they can go to find the dog of their choice. This kind of outreach and uh, counter messaging, if you will, is invaluable. Uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that um, I'm so grateful for what the NAI does and for all of you who work so hard uh, to counter the message, um, but there's more work to be done. And um, I look forward to joining with you in, in the fight.